Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I know this is a little uh, early for a workshop, but here we are. My name is Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Bill. Jay, the alcoholic. And what we're going to do this morning um, is talk about has AA lost its edge? You hear a lot of things around Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the things that you hear is that there was a time we had a 75% success rate, and now it's down to 10, maybe 5% or less. That we've lost something. That somehow the message has been diluted. Uh, the fellowship is different than it used to be. We're not working the steps correctly. The meetings are structured poorly. The message is not being conveyed. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to address some of that. And uh, Jay and I are blessed to be able to travel around AA a bit and talk to a lot of people. He's cursed with the historian problem. And, uh, <laughs> so, and both of us are cursed with the fact that we think we know some stuff. And, uh, and we're going to burden you with that a little bit this morning. Nope. Back. There we go. Scott Peck um, was a philosopher and a therapist and an all-around interesting cat. And one of the things that he really loved was Alcoholics Anonymous. And he loved watching us, and he knew a lot about us. And he would talk about us, and he would always preface his talks with, I can't stop, stop smoking, so whatever you hear from me is worthless. <laughs> so <clears throat> he says, thus I believe the greatest positive event of the 20th century occurred in Akron, Ohio on June 10, 1935 when Bill W. and Dr. Bob convened the first AA meeting. It was not only the beginning of the self-help movement and the beginning of the integration of science and spirituality at a grassroots level, but also the beginning of the community movement. Um, heck, what, one of the things that you hear a lot is that we have become a self-help movement. And that is not what AA is, but we've become that. So maybe we'll discuss that a little bit. The historian curse. <laughs> um, in the beginning, we're going to talk about numbers a lot today and where different things come from. Hank Parkhurst was one of the people who helped write the book Alcoholics Anonymous. He was a standard oil executive who drank himself out of a really, really good job. And he was Bill's real right-hand man uh, in New York. He actually was responsible for getting Bill to actually follow through with writing the book. And uh, Frank Amos was uh, the person who the Rockefeller Foundation sent out to Akron to investigate Alcoholics Anonymous. And he asked Hank in 1938 to put together a report on what's really happened. And so this is what uh, Hank came up with. Forty-one people we're on the ball. Here's, here's one who is not. <laughs> in fact, the, the, he's, he, is, he is in the next section, which is questionable. <laughs> we did that on purpose. Yeah. And of that, uh, there were six that were questionable. Twelve of these people that were in AA at the time were so difficult that they were practically denied. Okay? Ten were definitely sober, but out of touch. You know, we know they're still sober, we just can't find them. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 25 of the prospects were, uh, they were just prospects. They were people who won't. So now we'll go to Jim Burwell. Jim Burwell was another of the New York guys. And one of the privileges that I've had over the years is to actually hold his copy of the multilith copy of the big book, you know, the little pre-publication thing that they did. And in it, he had some numbers from the people that contributed to the writing of the big book. And he said that there were 48 men and one woman who actually were contributors. So you got 49 people that were active and contributed. Of the 49, there were 11 
that were continuously sober from the beginning, from the publishing of the big book. Jim, since he was writing it, happened to have had a few drinks, but it was bef- he came into AA, got sober, then had a few drinks. <laughs> but since he was writing the surveys, it was from the, when the big book came out, and he never drank from the time that the, the book came out. 38, the other 38, they at least picked up one more time, and either they stayed sober or they, or, or they didn't. But that's just a, another little number thing for you. Now, here's the Jack Alexander article. And uh, in, in the article, Jack talks about that AA is 100% effectiveness with the non-psychotic drinkers. <laughs> These are technical terms, right. Now, here comes the kicker in all... This is the caveat in all the numbers thing that goes on, is that who sincerely want to quit... Uh, and that's what was claimed by the workers of Alcoholics Anonymous. The program will not work, they add, with only those who want to quit or who want to quit because they're afraid of losing their jobs or their families. Uh, the effective uh, desire, they state, must be based on enlightened self-interest. The applicant must want to get away from liquor to head off incarceration or premature death. He must be fed up with the stark social loneliness which engulfs the uncontrolled drinker, and he must want to put some order into his bungled life. Another technical term. Yes. We do a lot of bungling at the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. And then this is a real, you know, if you ever want to meditate upon the miracle of this gift that we share, these numbers that Dr. Tebow, uh, that were provided to him by Alcoholics Anonymous, that he gave to the American Psychiatric Association in 1944. Okay. Statistics at the New York office of the organization read as follows. At the end of the first year, five recovered. At the end of the second year, 15 recovered. At the end of the third year, 40 recovered. The movement's going four years when they're putting the book out, a hundred people have recovered. At the end of the fifth year, 400, and then the Alexander article hits. And if you have, if you're in this room and you don't belong to aagrapevine.org, join, because you get all the cool stuff. And one of the things is, is the Alexander article, which you can also get at, at any AA meeting and read it. It's a, it's a wonderful piece. And it was sent by somebody who was coming in to bust AA up to prove that we were a fraud. That article comes out, and the fruit of that is 2,000 people at the end of the sixth year and 8,000 at the end of the seventh. The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous as a matter of long-established principle, policy, and practice does not engage in public debate and seeks to avoid public controversy. The authors of this paper must emphasize that we do not speak for AA. We have a personal interest in the history of AA and consider it imperative to correct historical inaccuracies and the propagation of myth. So what we're going to talk about now is this document. And... uh, by the way, if anybody would like to get this stuff, come on up here afterwards and give me your name and email address, and I'll email this out to you. It's pretty heavy, so we just didn't want to make a bunch of copies. But if you'd like to get it, and it's really fascinating. Um, recovery outcome rates. This was three guys, these three gentlemen, uh, looked at this. In essence, what they got tired of hearing this thing constantly talked about as if it's fact. People will throw around things, will just say stuff. They'll just say, we have a 5% success rate. And we all walk out of the meeting going, God, what has happened to AA? It's, di- it's chanting. Chanting is killing our fellowship. <laughs> and we've got to stop chanting. You know? That's what it is. You know? and, 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 we, and I myself have felt this. Like, my God, we, have we really lost something? Or you'll hear somebody else talk about, it's the drug addicts they're taking over. 
You know, the, it's the drug addicts. My God, we've got to weed them out somehow. What are, what are we going to do about the drug addicts? Why do they keep talking about that? You know, and AA is collapsing right around us. You hear it all the time. So these guys, and, and the source of the statistics that are used, This paper is written for AA members as an intent and is intended for internal and public circulation as an item of AA historical and archival research. It is offered to help inform the AA membership and academic researchers of a widely circulated misinterpretation and mischaracterization of AA recovery outcomes. Go ahead and move. Let's see. <clears throat> Every three years, Alcoholics Anonymous does a survey. They send out a survey to try to find out what's up with the fellowship, approximately how many people we have, how many <clears throat> meetings there are, and where they're located. And this is a very difficult thing to do. Um, number one, the only meetings that are contacted are a percentage of meetings that are registered with New York. God knows how many AA meetings there are that are not registered with New York. Um, in 1990, there was an internal memo that came out within GSO that took a snapshot of these from 1977 to 1989. Every three years, they took a snapshot and came up with this bar chart, or this chart. And what it shows is you've got 89, 86, 83, 80, and 77 and they track a snapshot of a group of approximately 11,000 people. And they track, they took this group and they said, all right, how many of you in this group are 30 days sober, 60 days sober, 90 days sober, and so on? So of the group, 19% were within their first month. First year. Hmm? First year. Right? What? First year. Right? Oh. Well, yeah, but in their first month sober. First month sober. Right. Thirteen percent second month, ten percent third month, and so on. And you can see it come down to where five percent of those people were in their twelfth month sober. This has been used to show that there is only a five percent recovery rate completely erroneous. It is that number of people were sober that length of time. So these guys that did this report, if you read this, will discuss how that was arrived at. And then this is what they did. First year, the first year retention data in the surveys does not contradict the 50% plus 25% success rate. In the first few weeks or months, the prospective member typically answers two questions. Am I an alcoholic? And number two, am I really trying? Many people come to AA and find out that they are alcoholics. For some, of the answer is obvious and easy. Others need to explore the question for a while. <clears throat> Here's the first year average. So this is just another way of looking at it. You can see the percentage point and the number of months, and it comes down here to 5%. Okay, so they lay this out. Next. Okay. Okay, now if you take these numbers and you do in statistical research what is called normalize, and you took each group, each percentage, and you started that off as 100%. So if you had uh, the, the first month, second month, third month people, whatever percentage that was, you start off at 100%, and then you extrapolate that to the end of the year, here's what you find of the first group, the first month, 26% statistically were sober at the end of a year. 38% of, of people with 60 days sober, people with 90 days sober at the end of a year, 50% were sober. The fourth month, 56%, and so on. So if you look at this, if you take these numbers and you turn it around and you say, okay, I've got this snapshot of this number of people. How many of them were there at the end of this reporting period? 
you get a completely different perspective. So here's another way of looking at it. This is the normalized numbers. Now you got to, if you, um, we're not going to spend 45 minutes trying to hash this out, but you can read this, and they're very clear about how they spell this out. Now here's another way of looking at it. Here's your 100 percent in each category, and the percentage at the bottom of the month. If you statistically extrapolate this. One other thing, when you look at the reporting that comes out of New York, one of the things that's used is in the last couple of surveys, the level of population has flattened out, the number of groups has even dropped a bit, or the population has dropped a bit. You've got to look at this. You've got a bunch of people back in New York that are doing the best they can with what they have. There are no attendance records. They have no idea. They have absolutely no idea how many AA meetings there truly are in the world, or in the United States, much less the world. They only know the ones that report to New York. So they take these numbers, and then they try to adjust them over a period of time when they believe, because they're, they're using estimates. In 93 and 94, a major revision occurred in the GSO accounting methods and record system. The number of groups reported no longer included those described as meetings. These are East Coast people. We're West Coast people. Mostly we have meetings. We don't have groups. And California is 20% of the population, as far as we can tell, of Alcoholics Anonymous. Just California. So they eliminate meetings, which chose not to be considered groups. Those meetings, typically special interest, alcohol and pill and family meetings, men's stags, <laughs> men's stags, women's stags, you know, yeah. special interest groups. <laughs> <coughs> are included in prior year data and inflate the numbers. So you've got this big number, then all of a sudden, boom! I'm getting, I'm getting cranked up. <clears throat> These years are often erroneously viewed as a drop in AA membership. So. Was there truly a drop in AA membership? The other thing they did, at one point in this same category, they doubled the number of meetings in Europe. They just doubled them. For no apparent reason, they doubled them. You know? no, we'll, no, we'll do that at the end. Bill. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. He's in charge. Otherwise, we'll never get done. Okay, so, so now we've got this. We've got this fellow. Say out here, um, meetings and groups are different. You know, and and in most of the world, a group will have a number of meetings. So that say there's 800 members in the group or 200 members in the group, and they've got six meetings or four meetings during the course of the week. All right, that's why they changed the reporting, because otherwise those people were getting counted again and again and again. Right. So, back to now back to the past. We're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how it is that they got the, you know, Clarence Snyder talked about having a ninety-three percent success rate or a ninety-five percent success rate. Where does this come from? Well, first let's talk a little bit about starting AA in a new area and why it is that these numbers maybe are pitched the way that they are. Here's Bill Wilson on getting started. Uh, getting Alcoholics Anonymous started in a new environment, okay? Like, we're coming to Dallas. It's usually a big job. In fact, a hell of a job to get a group functioning in a new locality. But once you have eight or ten uh, really on the ball, things go faster and much easier. Our experience shows that we cannot in the beginning walk into public hospitals or snatch lushers <laughs> off the street willy-nilly. Technical term, <laughs> willy-nilly. <laughs> and have much but a headache. It's very easy in this way to attract a big fellowship of panhandlers and mentally defective people. The Birch Street Alano Club. <laughs> 
Surely, Birch Street, are, they are all as important in God's sight as any of the rest of us, but they have had a tougher break. And we are finding that later on, when a group gets size and power, quite a number of these individuals can be assimilated, and those who can't or won't fall away quickly. But if you get too many of them in the beginning, you are really likely to find out that your home becomes a drinking club, a hospital, a bank, or a nursery. <laughs> so I like to say this is the price of the success rate that was given back in the day, okay? Because they had this little thing called pre-screening. Uh, here's one guy's experience. This is, comes from uh, Dr. Bob and the good old timers. A great read, a great read. After Clarence talked to me at my home, others would come over and talk to me. 25, they, they wouldn't let you in a meeting just by one guy talking to you as they do now. They felt you should know something about uh, where you were, what you were going to hear and the purpose of the program. Then Clarence made me go to the home of one of the newer members every night for three months. And they had nine or ten people talking to me. Then I had to read the big book before I went to my first meeting. As a result, I think I had a better understanding of what they were trying to do. Now, this is some correspondence that Clarence Snyder, if you don't, Clarence Snyder, uh, if you read in the, in the compilation of stories that we have out, uh, Experience, Strength, and Hope, he's in there as the home brewmeister. And, uh, he founded uh, AA in Cleveland, and uh, the, he and Bill were corresponding about what was going on in Cleveland. Why were they so successful? Well, the active or even recently active alcoholic was definitely not welcome at early meetings in Cleveland. In September of 1940, now again, remember, this is only four years into the movement, uh, Clarence wrote, Bill, that several groups do not permit a rummy to attend unless he has been hospitalized or talked to by 10 men. Clarence wrote that most groups required either hospitalization, being talked to by at least five members, or being passed by a committee before a new person could attend meetings. I think we should put the committees back together, don't you? <laughs> There's some people that need to be screened around here. My mind uh, is a committee at times. So, and you hear a lot about, you know, the wonderful work that Sister Ignatia did, and, and she and Dr. Bob did. And, and how did they do this? How did they do this? Well, after Bob's death, Sister Ignatia continued to have high statistics at St. Thomas Hospital because she made the AA members do uh, the pre-screening for her. She insisted that an Akron AA member in good standing had to sponsor the newcomer. In addition to making sure he had AA visitors, this meant agreeing to pay the newcomer's hospital expenses if he dropped out or did not pay for it himself. <laughs> Gives a whole nother little drift to sponsorship, doesn't it? In the Akron manual that Bob came out with, and when Jay and I do these sponsorship workshops, it states the same thing, that the sponsor should be fully prepared to pay the hospital bill of the newcomer. If that were the case, I would look at you in a completely different light. I'm sure glad your mom had the money. Yes. <laughs> God bless mom. Good old mom. So, you know, and Sister Ignatia is referred to as the angel of, to alcoholics, and this is how the angel functioned. Y okay, you can be certain that this made this pre-screening process rigorous indeed. Sister Ignatia normally allowed people only one chance to go through the hospital. Okay? On rare occasions, she would let a patient come back for a second try, but that patient would be completely isolated from the other incoming alcoholics so as not to tear down morale. In addition, no one at all got a third chance. So that's why hospitalization was so effective back in the day. David Hawkins, 
wrote a book called Power Versus Force. And in that book, um, he states, AA and its offshoot organizations have been estimated to have affected 50% of Americans at this time. 50%. If, it, if he's talking about just the United States, that's about 150 million people. They affect indirectly because they reinforce certain values by example. There are now close to 300 anonymous groups dealing with almost every form of human suffering. So one of the things that has happened in AA, as we have tried to stay true to our singleness of purpose, which is a very important concept. It's, it's not to be made light of. And the way Alcoholics Anonymous has approached singleness of purpose, it has given its program to absolutely anybody who wants it. Anybody. Almost. Almost. <laughs> there, there, there's a few. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> but wh the way we've done this is we've said, you have a cocaine problem, you have a heroin problem, you have an eating disorder, you have a... Start a group here. We will help you. We will help you. Here's the material. Here's the literature. Here's the book. Here's the steps. Here's the traditions. You know, we don't keep that to ourselves. We let anybody start. Now, if you look at the growth of AA, I believe this must be considered. The growth of these other 12-step programs must be considered as an offshoot of Alcoholics Anonymous. Cocaine Anonymous, one of our biggest brothers around here, good old CA. Um, we contacted their general service office, amount of sobriety, 1 to 90 days, 29%, 4 to 6 months, 12, 7 to 9 months, 6, 10 months to a year, 13%, 2 to 5 years, 23%, 2 to 5 years, 6 to 10 years, 8%, 20 years, 7%, 21 plus years, 2%. There are estimated 2,000 meetings a week worldwide. Uh, we thought there would be more meetings than that. I've traveled Europe a little bit, and, and Cocaine Anonymous is growing dramatically in Europe. I mean, it, some would say it's stronger, more structured, and organized in England than AA is. This is a really cool logo, isn't it? Um, I'd really, uh, if you want, take a look at this. This is the Iranian Narcotics Anonymous website. And um, for our brothers and sisters in the Islamic world, if you drink, this is considered a punishable crime, much different than with us. In some cases, even a capital crime. But doing dope? Ain't. So not only can you... Uh, you know, a drug problem is different from an alcohol problem because it's not moral. Okay? And so what's happening is, is in the Islamic world, just like here, the AA tents wide open, you know, everybody can come to the open meetings and, you know, they can hide out in the closed meetings and say they're alcoholics. Destroying the inner fiber of Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, the same thing happens for the, the lushers. In the Islamic world, they can go to the NA meetings and be uh, be full, fully uh, engaged members. You can't have AA meetings because that would be recognition that there is drinking going on. And there is, of course, no drinking going on in the Islam Islamic world. Our friend John that's here has personal experience with that <laughs> uh, when he was uh, in Brunei. Um, so this is what... Uh, uh, What's happening with now? Narcotics Anonymous was started in 1958. So in 1978, they said that there were fewer than 200 registered groups in three countries. By 1983, there are more than a dozen countries and 2,966 meetings. In 1993, 60 countries had over 13,000 groups holding over 19,000 meetings. In 2002, 108 countries had 20,000 groups holding over 30,000 meetings. In 2005, 116 countries had over 21,500 groups. And in 2007, 
There are over 25,000 groups holding over 43,000 weekly meetings in 127 different countries. That's huge. Yeah. And, That's a lot of people. And if you want something to meditate, you know, I mean, we've, we're talking about other fellowships because we didn't break down the international stuff for AA. But right now, at this moment in West Africa, there are groups of two and three alcoholics getting together where water's not safe to drink. Beer is cheaper than soda pop. And they're having an AA meeting. And our contributions to our general service office, you know, why our groups need to be registered, is funding the outreach to those people. It's an amazing thing that's going on. A lot on. of you know that I have this email list where I send out quotes and stuff and, and announcements and different things. Recently, a guy contacted me, and uh, he works for a, uh, an organization that is doing work in Rwanda. He's a sober guy working with this other outside or NGO. And he contacted me and he said, you know, there's no AA in Rwanda. And I said, well, I know people in South Africa and in Uganda. I know some people. Maybe we can do something. And I sent out a thing. And I also put him in touch with two guys at the general service office. And this guy's on the East Coast. He drove up to the general service office. They came up with a crate full of literature. And they have connections, not necessarily in Rwanda, but we're smuggling AA stuff into Rwanda, you know. And other people around the United States and other parts of the world have responded and are sending this guy literature. And he's heading over there for, for six months on his other uh, tour of duty. And they're going to start building Alcoholics Anonymous in Rwanda. I mean, it's just incredible. It's incredible. We've lost our edge. <laughs> so here, just for your, for your joy, is a list of some of the other anonymous groups that have sprung up of, of late. You know, we, can you see this okay in the back? Okay, great. Because, you know, like, here's it, here's it. You know, there's Alcoholics Victorious, which is a Christian uh, interpretation of the 12 step, going back to the original literature of the Bible. And, uh, you know, how many recoveries are there? In the grapevine, uh, three years ago, there was an article that stated that 51% of the people that are s recovered in the United States and by recovered uh, in the uh, insurance parlance that's two years abstinence okay that that this group of people 51 percent of them are sober in the anonymous groups 49 percent are sober in other things you know so like like uh, Alcoholics Victorious and the like or how about Befrienders uh, Anonymous uh, Befrienders International it's a suicide prevention group that uses the 12 steps. What's a slip in that? <laughs> <laughs> he said that. <laughs> Are there any guys in here whose wives want them to go to Clutter's Anonymous? <laughs> now, Bill, there's one you qualify for. Hepatitis C Anonymous. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> uh, then there's... Uh, Marijuana Anonymous, Obsessive Compulsive Anonymous. Those are very correct meetings, I'm sure. <laughs> lots of sex groups and lots of food groups. Uh, sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. How about Secular Organizations for Sobriety? They use the 12 steps, they just tweak it a little bit. You know. uh, trauma Anonymous for people that have PTSD. So, we've talked about the problem, or a perceived problem, but what's the solution? Are we going to do Gresham mm -hmm. first? Or? Well, let's see. Yeah. So, to describe the problem, uh, there's this, this uh, wonderful thing that was written by a guy by the name of Tom Powers Jr., who also is involved in another split-off movement called all Addicts Anonymous, they do things very correctly. They're an interesting little group up in Northeast uh, New York. I had the pleasure of going up and going to the spot, and it's their, their, their literature is very fascinating. But anyway, he uh, took an economic uh, model, which is Gresham's Law. And Gresham's Law says that bad currency tends to drive out good. 
In other words, if they're valued the same, that the bad currency, people are going to use that more than they will the good. And so it, it drives the good down. And that this has been operative in Alcoholics Anonymous, that weak AA is tending to drive out the strong. So there are three ways of working AA. When we use coffee as a metaphor because it works really good, right? Strong, the original way, proven powerful and reliably effective for over 70 years. The medium way, which is not so strong, not so safe, not so sure, not so good, but still effective. And the weak way, which is no way at all, but literally a false teaching. It's a corruption of the stated program. So what's strong? You do all 12 steps and keep on taking them. Keep on taking them. Practice rigorous honesty. Takes and continues to make restitution. No, we're not perfect. <laughs> um, admits faults. Prays and meditates daily, goes to two or more AA meetings weekly, actively works the 12th step. Bill, what's medium AA? I think we're all familiar with medium. If you've uh, been around any length of time, you've done medium. Yes. Um, medium works pretty good. It's not necessarily for the psychotic alcoholic, though. <laughs> It starts off with a bang, you stay sober, and then you procrastinate on the parts you don't like, maybe the God steps or the inventory steps. One meeting a week, that should hold us together. You know? <laughs> less and less self-examination. It's hard to self-examine when you're taking others' inventories. Uh, no effective sponsorship. You can say you have a sponsor, but it's been months since you've talked to him. Um, and service at a group level. The mistaking for activity for action does not mean that the activity is bad. But there's lots of people in AA that say, well, I don't sponsor people. I do other things. So, and they're, you know, their secretary of the meeting, they flip hamburgers at the Labor Day picnic. They're treasurer. They do a lot of stuff, which is positive. It's all part of being part of the community. But in the end, I think it, there's an emptiness to that because it's all about me doing things. And then finally, week AA, and if you've ever been around for a long time, there's also some times that we've done week AA. But, but as a program of recovery, you know, unlike the medium, big chunks are left out of the program. You go to lots and lots of meetings and you stay away from the first drink. It's like being a sober elk. You know, the, the, the deal about being in the, in the group is, is that the primary thing is we don't drink. And we go and do lots of stuff. The people who founded this program absolutely did not believe that it was possible for anybody to stay away from the front drink without spiritual help. And the whole program was set up for those who are beyond human aid. And yet, we found that this process is so incredibly powerful that you can just do a little bit of the spiritual exercises and still not drink. Now, whether you have a rich and full life, whether you actually have the spiritual awakening and all the fruits that, that come from Alcoholics Anonymous, we can, we can talk about that for a long time. If all you have is meetings, if that's all you have in AA, and, and you've fallen victim to the belief that if I go to 875,000 meetings a week, I'm doing AA, that that's what AA is, is lots of meetings. That's what it is. If you've fallen victim to that, it becomes critical how the meetings are run because that's all there is. The entire message that you receive is from the meetings. Therefore, it's, got to, it's critical. And I, my personal belief is that a lot of this, the AA has lost its edge, has come from this group, from people that are very concerned about how the meetings are degenerating. Because when they walk into that meeting, they're walking in to meet with their sponsor. That's their sponsor, is that meeting. That's where they get the message. That's the only place they get the message, is in that meeting. That there is nothing underneath it. There's no underpinning to hold us up. We're not walking in there to look for people to work with. We're walking in there to actually hear the message that we need. Whenever I hear somebody say that I, it's been a while since I've been to a meeting and I get really squirrely, 
I wonder about that, you know? I mean, if you're 20 years sober and you're going to eight or nine meetings a week, I personally think there's something wrong, you know? There, how could it be that? How, don't I have a life? I mean, the way it looks a lot is that you're working with a lot of people. There's people at the house. There's people you're on the phone with. There's people you're interacting with. You've got guys that are coming over and you're sitting reading the book with them, working the steps with them. I mean, to me, that's kind of the heart and soul of the whole thing. Just my opinion, but it's a really good one. <laughs> he criticizes me when I go to five meetings a week. I never criticize him. <laughs> So the other thing that we think that's really important is, aside from this idea that the, that the, that the core of Alcoholics Anonymous is, is working with others, and uh, my philosophy and the thing that we're always talking about is, you know, I, when I was 28 days sober, I had a guy ask me to sponsor him, and I had already gone through the first seven steps and uh, with my sponsor, and I called him up and I said, what do I do? And he said... If they're sick enough to ask you, you can't hurt them. <laughs> and I believe with all my heart, if God sends them to you, you can't hurt them. You know, and people say, well, I don't sponsor people, you know, or I'm not good at it. Well, just a second. Bill Wilson worked with, say, 700 people before he even went to Akron. None of them got sober. Was he good at it? Is there any of the spiritual exercises that we're good at? I mean, there's the whole not drinking thing up front. There's none of these things that are... But over time, as we get after it, we grow in effectiveness. And that's what this thing is about. So... How is it that we make sure that our meetings, we make sure that our groups are functioning along these lines? That they're not just a place for, you know, coming in to talk about my day. Well, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a wonderful piece of literature. I know this is really awful to do, but I'm going to strongly recommend that you go to the soft literature rack on occasion. It's really interesting what's in there. And there's one new pamphlet, uh, the new graphics on it, it's green, called the AA Group. And in the AA Group is a thing that's recommended for AA meetings to do called the Group Inventory. So if in your AA community there's a strong ethic of sponsorship, if that ethic really lives, the meetings will reflect that. We don't have to go to the meetings to get what we need. We create it, and the meetings reflect what we as a group have. So every so often, your group can do this inventory. You can look as a group, which is part of the growing process, of me actually becoming part of a larger whole, that it's not springing forth from me, that, that God does actually reveal himself in the group conscience. We say that. The group inventory will actually reveal the reality of that, that it really is a true thing. Many groups periodically hold a group inventory meeting to evaluate how well they are fulfilling their primary purpose to help alco other alcoholics to recover. Uh, AA suggested 12 steps of recovery. Some groups take inventory by examining our 12 traditions one at a time to determine how well they are living up to the principles. What's next? So here are the questions. What's the basic purpose of our group? And then you talk about it. All your friends at the meeting, even the ones you don't like, hear what they say. What more can our group do to carry the message? Is our group attracting alcoholics from different backgrounds? Are we seeing a good cross-section of our community, including those with special needs? Well, out here in the South Bay, you know, we don't have a large, you know, you know, pool of folks, of different folks. But we've got enough strange ones. Psychotic ones. Yes. 
Do members stick with us or does the turnover seem excessive? If so, why? What can we as a group do to retain members? Do we emphasize the importance of sponsorship? How effectively? How can we do it better? And in this, when you do this inventory process, there's no votes taken. We're not, we're not, we're not here to decide structure or anything. We're allowing the group conscious to speak, especially people that may be sitting in the group that feel they have no voice. When we did this at the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag, there was a whole group of people that rose up within that group that really felt they had no voice. Maybe they weren't complaining about it that much, but they felt that there were these other people that were usurping a lot of time. This was an opportunity for these people to express themselves without fear of any kind of condemnation or that there was going to be a vote taken or anything to allow them to feel part of the group. Are we careful to preserve the anonymity of our group members and other AAs outside the meeting rooms? Do we also leave what they share at meetings behind? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, does our group emphasize to all members the value of keeping up with the kitchen setup, cleanup that are essential for our 12-step efforts? I mean, if you're meeting at a church, having been a vice president of a church, one of the things that the insurance companies now don't want us meeting at the, don't want the church providing us with stuff. Just so you know, when you're there, when, when you're on church property nowadays, their uh, legal people and their insurance people don't want you there. And they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart because they believe what it is that we do, okay? And are you getting, are you once in a while like sending them a copy of the 11th step once a year and thanking them for the privilege of using the room you know letting them know that the purpose of this thing this is what we're this is what we're promoting um, and you think that they know but you know the the boards turn over and folks you know the folks don't uh, don't know are uh, are all the uh, members of the group uh, able to speak at meetings and participate in other group activities um, nine, are they mindful that holding office is a great responsibility not to be viewed as an outcome of a popularity? In other words, when you're having a group uh, vote, is it that you're just voting for your buddies? Or are you voting for the woman or man who could most benefit from being of service? And ten, are we doing all we can to provide uh, attractive meeting places. Does our group do its fair share toward participating in the purpose of AA as it relates to our three legacies, recovery, unity, and service? What has our group done lately to bring AA message to the attention of professionals in the community, the physicians, clergy, court officials, educators, and others who are often the first to see alcoholics in need of help? How is our group fulfilling its responsibility to the seventh tradition? So, you know, a lot of these questions you can just check off. You can say, well, hey, we're doing pretty good, or this really doesn't apply. But when you ask yourself the question, what are we doing to, to carry the message out to professionals, you know, and the answer to a lot of groups is, well, nothing. We don't do that. We're just here in the Alano Club, and we just meet, and that's what we do. Good morning, you know. Maybe it's time to do more. Maybe you might think, stop and think about that if your group asks itself that question, Maybe there's somebody there that you don't even know about who's a doctor. And he says, well, you know, I could really use a couple of people to come over to the hospital where I work at and talk to these people because they don't know what to do with these alcoholics. They just, you know, that question might come up. We are responsible for making sure that when folks come in, they're greeted. And if you're, you know, and if you sh if you're showing up at the meeting and you're talking to your friends, and you're not greeting the new person, what are you doing? You know, what are we doing? You know, and and for me, it's really important to realize that the people that I'm meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous might not be on the same terms that I met them when I came into AA. In other words, I came into an AA where all I had to do for entertainment on any given moment at any given day was go down to the Alano Club, order a cup of coffee, and there'd be a phone call within a few hours that there was a 12-step call and I had a Pinto that I'd been living in and I could go out and get them. And they said, don't talk to them, but just bring them back. 
you know. And But I mean that that's how I engaged with him. That's not the way you meet people now in Alcoholics Anonymous. So what is it that we can do? How can we as a group use all the great resources that we have to make Alcoholics Anonymous inviting and effective to the people that come in? So, you know, kind of wrap this thing up. What's really happened? What's really happened to Alcoholics Anonymous? Well, AA's overall membership estimates if observed as a broad indicator, signal that AA is doing something right and has been doing so for quite some time. In, second, in seven decades, estimates of uh, membership have grown from two members and two groups in the United States to almost two million members in 100,000 groups worldwide. That is not a measurement of doing something wrong. In the bottom line on this report that we've used most of this for, and then at the end kind of our opinion, um, they come up with that probably in the good old days, which Tom I says there were no good old days, these are the good old days. Yeah. But back in the old days, there was probably closer to a 40% success rate. And today, there's probably about a 40% success rate, if you look at it. Have the demographics changed? Dramatically. We don't go into hospitals and bring them in anymore. They just show up. They just come here. They get sent here from all kinds of different places. And if it's true that when anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA to be there for that, I am responsible. I believe it's up to us to adjust to what's coming in, not try to control what's coming in. It's up to me to carry the message, not the meeting. It's up to me. And if there's enough me's around, if we're getting together and we're actually inventorying ourselves as a group, we will carry that message, one of us at a time, Groups of us together carrying the message, if we understand what that message is and how to carry it. I think that there's a way to do that. There is an approach to addressing another alcoholic. Number one, you have to start. It's on the job training. So our belief, Jay and I, and our travels and, and many other people, and there's many people here in the room that travel around AA quite a bit. I think Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well and as, as vibrant as it has ever been. I believe it's better now than it was years and years ago. I think it's stronger. I think it helps more people. I think the singleness of purpose that we talk about is alive and well. You can look at the number of groups that we have helped start. We don't weed them out, we help them. We don't talk about them and shove them away. We bring them in and then tell them where we think they should go to get the help they need. You know, I'm, I, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous guy. I have connections in Cocaine Anonymous. I have connections in Narcotics Anonymous. I know people. I just went and spoke at a retreat for Crystal Meth Addicts Anonymous. You try spending a weekend with a bunch of tweakers. <laughs> there, those people are quick. <laughs> and then they have no teeth. You know, what's that about? You know? I hear I hear people I hear people say in my travels that, well, if they ask me to go speak at another fellowship, I don't go. I don't have that experience. I will go anywhere God sends me. Anywhere. Why wouldn't I? How do I know why I'm supposed to be there or not? Alcoholics Anonymous goes anywhere. It helps those people. They're our brothers and sisters. They're not an opposing uh, organization that we are in competition with souls for. You know? I mean, they're our friends. They're on the same path. They want exactly what we want. Why wouldn't we help them? Why wouldn't we partner with them? You know? It's, I'm, I'm, there I go again. <laughs> One of the things that is, uh, that is wonderful is when somebody new comes into Alcoholics Anonymous 
and they don't know what it, where they are. And they say, oh, I'm an addict, or I'm a substance abuser, or that kind of stuff. And how is it that we, you know, where did we get in this thing where we yell at these people? You know, they haven't been able to diagnose themselves yet. And what we're here to do is to help them diagnose themselves. What are you? Back to this thing about the two questions that we have to help people with. Number one, am I an alcoholic? And number two, am I really trying? And we get to show them by example what really trying looks like and what a wonderful thing it is. And this roundup and the people that are involved here and the stuff that goes on in raising the consciousness of our community and that we get to carry out is an amazing privilege. And don't miss the party. It's a wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the question is, we're going to repeat the question for the, for the tape. The question is, this, uh, this thing on AA recovery rates, uh, myths and misinterpretation. Our friend, uh, the, the guy that I know is a guy by the name of Glenn C. He has a website called HeinzFoot.org. HeinzFoot, H-A-I-N-D-S. F-O-O-T dot org. He just got done writing a marvelous biography about Vic Kitchen, the guy who wrote I Was a Pagan. He's a, uh, an AA dude that has been very, very active and involved. The other two gentlemen I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. But again, get the documentation from Bill so that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, go from that. Your email address is uh, Bill C at Bill C at Craig Tools, C R A I G T O O L S dot com. And you can also sign on this list if you want, I'll send it out to you. Any other questions? Oh, come on. Yeah. You know, it's a little off the subject, but, but going back to the Washington, you know, they, they started with like three or four guys, and all of a sudden there's 100,000 and then they're gone. But the time it took them to get to 100,000. Um, Danny wants me to go on a rant about the Washingtonians, and I'll I'll uh, I'll decline. We didn't talk afterwards. Yeah. Um, if you um, yeah, if you send it to Bill, we'll we'll make it available. We'll make the PowerPoint available. Sure, Steve. Yeah, can we can we summarize what the three guys came up with? Essentially, like at the end, what they what they come up with, and and they go into great detail. Any of you that really understand statistics or have been formally educated, these guys really really tear this thing apart and break it down and explain exactly how New York gathers its information and what they do with it. And once again, this five percent thing was an internal memo that got out somehow, which was never meant to come out. They just looked at the numbers and were questioning them. What, what does this mean? Essentially, what they come up with is that the old guys, when they, talk, they, they tell the history of where the 75% came from, when it was first stated, and how it got carried forward, and when Bill Wilson stopped using it. In about 1958, he stopped talking about 75% because by that time it was apparent that it wasn't accurate. But it isn't also 5%. It's probably closer to 40. Once again, when you get into the numbers, how can you know? Now, when we sit down and talk to people, like I'll sit down with, with Cliff R or Tom I or some of these guys that have been around a long time and have been sponsoring people, and every one of them, I've never heard anybody say, that they don't have a better than 75% success rate with those who really try. With those who really try. Well, 
what Marianne's saying is, well, it's silly to quibble about it because what other, what other success is there out there? Well, it's like the statistic that Jay quoted, you know, that they've come up with somewhere. Of the people that are in recovery, 49 or 50 percent are in 12-step programs. The other half are somewhere else. Yeah, they're, they're in you know, churches. They're in, they're in churches. And they're in there are all people co- sober therapy. all over hell, you know. You know, yeah. but once again, how do you extract that number? How do you, you know, wh- it's really difficult to come up with any accuracy. Yeah. yeah. Brian? Did you guys have access to any information that talked about the spread of sobriety? I know you had the numbers, Bill, for CA. Do we have similar numbers for AA in your trips back and forth to New York? Yeah, there was, the question was about uh, long-term sobriety, one of the or uh, breakdown of sobriety. We don't have something that we we, uh, but we have something about five to ten years. How many people in the meetings have between five and ten years, and how many have uh, you know ten to twenty? I mean, the the amount of long-term sobriety that's available now is just amazing. I mean, if you go downstairs right in in a few minutes. We've got this wonderful long timers meeting, and there's a whole bunch of people. I mean, last year I was there with, I mean, I got sober in a little Alano club in Manhattan Beach, California. And I can go down there this afternoon, and there'll be 150 people that I met in my first eight weeks of sobriety. So, yeah. yeah Jay, thanks for today's lesson. What is that? How does it relate to open and closed meetings and singleness of purpose? I hear that in areas that it upsets me, but how does it affect Well, the question is about, about, you know, open and closed meetings and singleness of purpose. I think that, you know, again, that's kind of outside the scope of what it is that we're trying to, trying to speak about. I don't think it's ever been broken down that, that way. But we, um, you know, we're trying to speak about, you know, the fellowship as a whole and, and including all the, all the thing, you know, the stag meetings. I mean, one of the things that at least we found in our neighborhood that that the women's stags, I mean, and the men's stags, really, if people are attending those, their participation and involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous almost skyrockets. I mean, if first time I saw the phone list for my wife's home group, I thought these women should not be able to get together, <laughs> all on the same night in the same place. We've got to do something about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is a good indicator, a hard indicator of how many spin offs there right. are. I know that's just a, a, an estimate, but have you heard any do that or like that? Well, the question is about the number of groups. The, 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 the thing that we showed from David Hawkins, his book, Power Versus Force, he, the number that he got was 300 anonymous groups. You know, and uh, Look it up on the there's internet, there's right? a bunch mutating. A friend of mine who's on the uh, on the uh, trustees committee at Alcoholics Anonymous told me that one of the really entertaining points they save it because uh, a bunch of nonsense, of course, happens at a trustee thing for Alcoholics Anonymous World Services. But for the entertainment segment, what they do is they go through the people that have applied, you know, for for people to be granted to use the twelve steps. They said some of it's just hilarious. <laughs> Um, to long-term sobriety, there's a chart in here <clears throat> where they took the surveys that have done the triennial surveys. Back in 1977, the average length of sobriety was 4.3 years of the people surveyed, okay, whatever that number might be. Uh, the av- in 94, is it 90, 2004? The average length of sobriety is 8.1 years. It doubled the average length. Once again, you've got to take this with a grain of salt, but there's clearly a trend upwards where people are staying sober for long periods of time. Tom? Um, Tom's question is about the, the use and sponsor and sponsorship. 
where did the term come from when they were used? Yeah, I mean, it, it came from the gate. People were sponsored in the Oxford group. And all our early members, you know, the first few years were alcohol members of the alcoholic squad of the Oxford group. Um, and uh, so, yes, the term was, but I mean, the real thing about sponsorship, though, you can see, comes from Akron and Cleveland. Uh, there's, there's one of the things where uh, Clarence said they were working with three hospitals in the area in 1940 that were churning out between 15 and 21 alcoholics a month. You know, but they were being, you know, their stays were being sponsored. So it's, uh, it it's, comes from the very beginning. Well, the, the reason we were spending time on the other anonymous programs, we, the point we were trying to make that if you want to really look at the growth in Alcoholics Anonymous, I think you ha have to. You have to look at the growth in these other organizations. But I thought it was, I thought, I thought the recovery rate AA. That's what this, yeah. right. Yes. That's what these guys are doing. But the reason, NAA. the reason that we were talking about the, 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 the one of the, things that we hear when we're out and about is is that AA's flatlined. It's not growing anymore. It's not growing anymore. It's not growing exponentially like it was, you know, twenty five years ago, uh, uh, when 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 Bill came in. I mean I mean AA in, in the neighborhoods just I don't know about where well we in the same neighborhood. I mean there were six hospital treatment programs that were churning out thirty people a month apiece and they were in a date in the meetings. And I mean it's not like that anymore. And so what we wanted to do was show how this thing that we have birthed has, is, is growing worldwide and in and, and all the different permutations. And I think that that's important when we're talking about you know, the, the, uh, the effect of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you, if, you look at the, if you look at the history of heroin, for example, if you look, look it up on the Internet, look up heroin, and there's this illusion that people didn't start doing heroin until the 50s or the 60s. People have been doing heroin since the 1800s, you know, laudanum and stuff like this. There were dope fiends in AA from the start. There were people that were getting loaded, and they weren't drinking that much, and they started coming in, and AA looked at that and said, what are we going to do with this? 1958, Narcotics Anonymous. Um, who's the guy... Uh, the old rock and roller that helped found uh, uh, Eddie Cochran. Eddie Cochran used to say, I'd, "I'd sit in an AA meeting and I'd talk about dropping Reds, and they thought I was shooting communists." You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So you know, I got to get away from these lame alcoholics, and they started Narcotics Anonymous. Before then, they started Al-Anon because the women, the wives, because they're only men alcoholics, right? You know, I mean, read the history. It was. They wanted to come, and they, these guys wanted to have closed meetings, so they formed another organization that helped the families. This is, this is part of the recovery process of Alcoholics Anonymous, is to help people get help, whoever they are. And in that sense, it's very open. AA as a separate organization has a singleness of purpose, vital to our, to our existence. But don't lose sight of the fact that we've also been more than willing since the beginning of this organization to help anybody with any problem they might have. Can we do that in the context of AA in a meeting? Probably not, but we can help them go find help. So I think in the growth of the program, you have to look at these spin-offs. Mike? I'm sorry? Lengths of in this room. Oh, survey of lengths of sobriety in this room. Okay. How many people, uh, how many people in this room uh, are in their first year of sobriety? Okay. All right. Uh, in their first uh, five years of sobriety? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ten? Okay. Fifteen? Twenty? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 25, you know, 30, 
It works. It really does. You're all alone, Bill. Yeah. Still. <laughs> uh, shh. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I'm wondering if you guys, first of all, thank you very, very much. And great shoe, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> would, you agree that, would you agree that another reason for this misperception of the 5% rate is because, and, and I have to agree, when you sit in a meeting in your home group, you do see that huge rotating crowd. Uh, it's easy to buy into the five percent. Would you agree that it's uh, also partially because we are so widely accepted these days that million outside agencies send people to watch AA who never really, as you said, try AA, mm -hmm. and so we're throwing in our mind into the statistic people who watch AA instead of who are doing AA. Absolutely. Even knowing. Would you agree that? Then? One of the, one of the quotes in this pamphlet is it says that any retail organization or uh, uh, say a car sales, a car dealership, they look at the number of cars sold, not at the number of people window shopping. And I think you're exactly right. I think we have a tendency to look at the window shoppers and watch them as they rotate, you know, in and out and think, oh my God, you know, that this, is, this isn't working, you know. And, you know, like we just did our little survey, it is working, but there are lots of window shoppers, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know this as well as anybody with your place out there that the kids are coming now. I mean, the children are coming and they refuse to leave. <laughs> you know, our our home group, our home group, the Hermosa Beach Men Stag. There are 120 guys. Of that, of that, 50 percent are under the age of 20 years old. Yeah. Wouldn't you say that, Josh? That probably half that room is certainly under 21 or 22. Yeah. 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 And um, and they work better programs, and they'll tell us <laughs> than we do. We had a, we had a kid, 15 years old, took a one year cake, and he stood up there and he gave the most right wing AA talk I've ever heard. <laughs> At the end of it, he looked out at everybody and he said, if you're sitting out there and you're not working the steps and you don't have a sponsor, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> I walked right up to him and asked him to be my sponsor. <laughs> and we were, for weeks, we were walking around looking at each other going, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> you know? But it, the, access, the access is there now. This is what, exactly what Bill Wilson wanted. He, he wanted hospitals across the country. My father was part of the big 12-step. They were trying to go back to, to Washington to get the federal government to recognize it as a disease. And so they'd quit incarcerating alcoholics so that recovery would be available. And today, you and I live in an environment, in a society, where recovery is available to everyone. Mm. And you're sitting with those kids when you're sitting across. It's like looking at ourselves when we were 17, 18 and stuff. I mean, it's redemption. And, you know, the other thing is, is we just want to really thank all of you for, for allowing us to, because of, of your uh, desire, to be able to really sit down and try and clarify what it is that we think and feel about Alcoholics Anonymous and, and to be able to put it in, a, in, in something that we hope will be useful. And we really want to thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very thank much. You.